Why hello there, welcome back to the Agassino Zynga show with me your host Agassino Zynga and this is episode number 425, that's 425 of the Agassino Zynga show, I'm hoping it's 425 not 426, maybe it's 426, one of them anyway, welcome back, hope you're doing well wherever you may be. If it's your first time, check out the show via YouTube. Make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, and leave me a comment down below. That would be greatly appreciated. And if you're listening via the podcast app, a download and a share would also help me to spread the show and get it out there to new listeners. And of course, support via Patreon is welcome too at patreon.com for slash Agostino. You can donate to the show for a letter's one dollar, which is the equivalent of one pound per episode episode per episode per month and you get access to one bonus episode per month from me one bonus episode per month from me if you donate one pound the equipment of one dollar via patreon that one bonus episode there'll be a little more racier content a lot more racier views and opinions and some not so secret stories about some debauchery induced nights that i may have had in the past so if you want to experience all that in its full hd form definitely sign up to my patreon that's patreon.com for just agostino patreon.com for just a-g-o-s-t-i-n-h-o first episode goes out at the end of this week so make sure you tune in and get involved don't delay sign up on there today so how are you guys doing how are you guys feeling good great amazing how am i pretty pretty good all things considered or think I said not too bad I have to be completely honest um what have I been doing so I'm in what approaching day three of my seven day running challenge so far not feeling that bad um it's been pretty good to be fair being able to get out and just you know get out into nature have some fresh air day to day because most of the time I do try to avoid going outside and I uh, try and spend as much time as I can indoors to avoid any possibility of me contaminating the horrendous virus that's spread across our world at the moment just because I can't be bothered to get sick not because I'm scared of anything you know I just I just not in the mood to be going to hospitals and being put on ventilators and stuff it's just not my vibe you know I think I'm okay in that rationale. So I do try to spend as much time as I can indoors, of course. Grocery shopping, all that malarkey has to be done. So I venture out, protect myself and all that good stuff. But apart from that, I don't really spend much time outdoors, which of course isn't good for my overall health and sanity. So this little seven-day running thing has been a bit of an eye-opener in terms of how important it is. Again, this is some standard information that I think most people will be aware of, but it definitely has reiterated or reminded me of the importance of making sure that I leave my house in one way shape or form each day even if it's just a little lap around a block it's best um it's the best remedy for the situation we're in at the moment it gives you a bit of perspective it allows you to disconnect one a little bit and there's something about the cold crisp air um out there at the moment especially because no one's outdoors that seems to hit you a bit different it's a bit sad, don't get me wrong. I have to be completely honest. Um, having run a couple of days now around my area and travel to other areas too, obviously along my run, it does feel a bit sad out there. You can just feel a bit of sadness. Now, I could be projecting because, you know, I'm not necessarily, you know, gleefully skipping down the streets, but I do somehow feel, you know, people are just bored. Um, there's hardly anybody out in the streets. Don't get me wrong. I've been out at what, 6 a.m., 8 and I think 10 a.m. So people are not really going to be hanging out doing the Mardi Gras, but there isn't any commotion there's not much traffic out there because there's hardly anything open apart from off licenses and chicken shops really for the most part and of course some you know betting shops not betting shops i'm not sure betting shops are open but regardless there's not much open so people can't really go places but i do feel a sense a tinge of sadness when i'm outdoors i have to be completely honest people are just it feels like they're kind of fed up but um the seven day plan has been working so that's good um, I'm probably going to add a few more things on my list with stuff that I want to do before the year is up. I think, like I said previously in other shows, it's really important, more so than ever this year, to have some resolutions that you want to do for the new year, some goals, some things that you want to achieve. I think outside of restrictions being lifted, I think if you tell yourself, oh, I want to travel in all these places after everything's open up, those are sort of dependent on other parties allowing you to do x y and z i think it's important to have some goals in mind that you can do on on your own accord to give you something to sort of take your mind off the daily scourge of what's going on um you don't need to be constantly reminded of it you don't need to be following the news constantly about it 
if if it's news that you need to know you'll probably find out one way shape or form via the timeline someone's going to text you you don't need to be glued on the screen watching those things you don't need to be you know because there's a lot of the media like i said before some of these media companies have to take a lot of responsibility too for helping to drive um or add to the sadness and the exasperated feelings of like you know emptiness that people are feeling at the moment how many more of these misery stories that they would have to kind of get out to us about people passing away relatively young we know it's been affecting people disproportionately older people but we also do know that there are cases where somebody fit and healthy happens to pass away just through you know pure bad luck you know um uh unlucky in the gene pool in terms of you know what family they were born into underlying uh, conditions they weren't even sure about you know we know that happens to be constantly reminded of those stories and have their faces plus all over certain sites and stuff i don't see how that's really helpful i really don't um if anything it just makes the situation worse those stories were maybe important to maybe relay in a bigger sense you know to get it out there as much as you can in the beginning when people were doubting the severity of the virus and were kind of willingly taking risk because they didn't think it's going to affect them but now everyone knows basically what the deal is for the most part right I, I, unless you're a dj you know the flipping risks that are involved um with covid and you know not treating it as seriously as you can and you move accordingly but you don't need constant reminders from the media do you know what i mean telling you that some you know uh blue-eyed some bright-eyed you know 25 year old unfortunately passed away due to complications with covid that's just not really going to be helpful again for the families i'm sure they want their story to be heard and i assume part of the grieving process is definitely you know people maybe acknowledging your pain especially during now right we all find i don't know there's a kind of anonymous feeling where you sort of feel like you're just a number right even the numbers that they're saying we passed what the hundred thousand mark in terms of deaths in the uk and it still doesn't hit you as much in it maybe because we're indoors we don't see anything maybe because because i think someone made the a point once that maybe the reason why we don't necessarily feel the loss as much is because the virus is silent but deadly it doesn't necessarily have any outwardly symptoms apart from the coughing and sneezing there's not there's no like pusses and pores opening up and skin color this this colorization or whatever it may be called you don't convulse on the floor do you know what i mean it's sort of like a slow but silent killer you just kind of disappear into hospital for treatment and then you either come out or you don't but there's no obvious thing right that people can point to me oh my god he got it worse than she got it right um that's that might be the reason why but still there's you know every number is important so maybe part of the stories are those families trying to deal with that loss and wanting the press to put it out there and publicize it so that the loss is acknowledged because it, it could it, should, it could probably hurt it probably hurts a lot in it imagine losing a family member during this time and you can't see them so you can't say goodbye which is a de definitely an important part of grieving that closure you could don't have that and then you feel as if you've been completely ignored and no one has heard your story all right um someone in your family who you love has just come and gone and no one knows maybe that's part of it i'm not too sure but regardless i think for yourself to kind of keep yourself somewhat sane like I said, I've only, I'm only a few days into it and I have to say it's been a huge benefit. And again, I'm somebody who should know better because I've always set myself goals and targets. And I think this year has been the only one where I sort of kind of fell off the wagon in that regard. But I've always had New Year's, I've always had New Year's resolutions. I've always had little short experiments that I run on myself just to kind of keep myself um, on my toes for the most part and just to give myself a target to aim for give myself a bit of structure because i know how loose i can get with stuff and even i can say these three days have been probably the best three days i've had in lockdown having something to look forward to in terms of this little challenge i'm doing i'm recording little videos i'm going to put into a little vid youtube vloggy thing and upload it you know what i mean it's just little stuff little projects that you just give yourself that just help and i really do think it's important so if you can write those down if you can you know vocalize them share them with friends whatever it is make yourself accountable do it um it's better than sitting there glued to the news you know day in day out in my opinion in my opinion anyway jam pack show for you today i'm sipping on some nice pg tips with a dashing of honey so if you've got a drink grab it drink it you've got something to snack on grab it eat it let's drive drive jump in on the show 
Oh, lovely. So, um, unfortunately, uh, Matt Hancock let us know in a press conference the other day that there's no um, easing of the measures for COVID in the UK for at least for the time being, which shouldn't be a much of a surprise considering how royally we fucked the situation up completely, didn't we? Right? Um, so the following, this is difficult to put a timeline on when the lockdown will be lifted. The health secretary said that there were early signs and measures were working, but it was not a moment to ease up. He said that there are 37,000 people in hospital with coronavirus in the UK, more people on ventilators than any other time in the whole pandemic. The pressure of the NHS remains high. We've got to get that case right down. He said the number of coronavirus cases in the UK has been falling, but the number of people in hospital remains high, as is the UK's death numbers. A further 592 people have died of the UK COVID within 28 days of a positive test, and another 22,195 cases have been recorded. According to Monday's government figures, there are 4,076,000 people in hospital on ventilators. So all that is grim, but the most important stuff is the top bit right where finally in the press conference because you know when they give these little speeches they have an opportunity for the press and journalists to ask questions i think there are some times where they they you have questions submitted by an audience but usually um it's questions from journalists and stuff and they usually lowball crappy questions that no one really cares about but this is the first time we've kind of heard journalists pull the part some mp or some members of the government to task and ask for actual clear um guidelines and information as to when lockdown will be ended and i think it's because we've finally all reached at the end of our tether so it's good to see them finally calling out the government but um maybe this is a little too late in terms of the accountability side of things i'm interested to see what happens um in our local elections right is it may i think may some sometime we have local elections I'm interested to see what happens because there's obviously this theory out there at the moment, which I've spoken about how they want to do this whole May Day opening up thing, right? They want to essentially get the economy back up and running around May Day, open up bars and restaurants and stuff in the hope that they can open in the hope that they can kickstart the economy and obviously provide a platform uh, for that G7 summit to take place. I think it's in Colchester or Cornwall, some one of those places, which, you know, you, the conspiracy theories are going to have a, a a field day with that one in it right easing of the lockdowns only comes in place a couple of months before a big global um you know quasi big reset um meeting of european heavyweights in the middle of cornwall people are going to have a field day but if that's the case there could be an argument for people just wanting to move on in may or just forgetting about it right about the about what happened because people's memories are short if people are allowed to go on holiday they're allowed to go to a pub let's go to a favorite restaurant maybe go to a nightclub or two when may elections come around um the government could easily spin it as a victory right hey we got you the vaccine we got you guys earlier out of the situation than you probably first envisioned so you know help us out a bit here right you kind of you know show us your support show us how you what that meant to you in that respect don't you think that i don't know there's a part of me that thinks maybe they can hustle this into their favor it sounds weird it sounds far-fetched but i can definitely have seen it happened before in the past and maybe it happens again you never know you never know moving forward there's this really interesting infographic graphing i've seen online right courtesy of courtesy of this guy called david boxenhorn right and he posted uh this little graph and sheet that says the following the biggest spreaders are between the ages of 10 and 30 the sources from i'm assuming the israeli dashboard in terms of coronavirus spreaders right so obviously it's from israel so it's not information that's per, you know directly relating to the stuff that we have here in the uk or wherever you are in the world but there is this idea out there that exists the common sort of theory is that the reason why covid is such a big killer and it's so deadly is because it's an asymptomatic virus right you can have it not know and spread it to hundreds if not thousands of people so it makes it lethal 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 but 
obviously to help stop the spread there are certain things that you can do similar to what in australia or new zealand do if you're an island close your borders track and tracing really strict quarantine measures bloody blah 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 but there's also this idea about lockdowns right which we somehow have consistently gone back to in the uk we're in our third national lockdown now at the moment and so far it hasn't necessarily worked the way that we would hoped it would have worked it's obviously worked in terms of requiring most people to stay indoors which then artif which then by its very essence limits the amount of people that spread it but in terms of containing it in some way shape or form or just kind of getting a number down the r number down drastically down over a short period of time it doesn't necessarily seem to work and there's also a short window of compliance there's only so many times you can ask an entire population to hunker down at home um you know essentially jeopardize their future and the future of their family and the economy at large for um something that they kind of feel like should have been handled better in the beginning so the theory goes maybe if you actually want to do a lockdown and make it effective the effective way to do it would be to do a short sharp sweet one in the beginning with set goals in terms of what numbers you want to achieve at the end or a more controversial idea would be to only lock down the segment of the population who are the biggest spreaders so you'd essentially lock down everybody from the ages of 10 to 30 years old and then the rest of the people you'd obviously enforce some sort of restrictions in terms of moving but in terms of actually leaving their homes if you're between the age of 10 to 30 you don't leave your house you stay indoors you know what they said earlier about older people oh if covid is real what i think that the, there was this idea around um flipping it the other way around and the beginning of this whole debate about covid some of the skeptics were like oh if that's true then all the if you're old and you're vulnerable you should stay at home and everyone else should be able to live their lives right that's what that was what some people would say but why not flip it on his head and do it the other way around and say all those influencers that are flying around all over the place they're the ones that should be staying indoors and everyone else should be having the ability to move around freely obviously with um the knowledge that you can't do certain things but that would actually help to stem the flow of covid whilst you know the medical teams and institutions were able to deal with whoever needs to deal with vaccines are developed in the background it's an interesting theory in it or an approach to do and i wonder if that would have worked especially in the uk i wonder if maybe if that would have been a better way to do things now don't get me wrong there's loads of things that happened in between times with the government that just didn't help the situation right the eat out to help out thing boris not taking it seriously in the beginning um lack of circuit breakers non-closing of the borders all these things definitely affected the way that we responded to the issue to begin with but maybe a more interesting and applicable idea especially in the uk would have been just to lock down people from a certain age group and then enforce restrictions on the rest have some clear numbers and targets in place and then go from there what do you think let me know in the comments down below i'd love to hear your opinion moving on moving on oh this is courtesy of tmz right yeah courtesy of tmz the never-ending saga between Tory Lanez and Megan Thee Stallion takes another dramatic turn. Another, another dramatic turn. So, TMD said the following. Tory Lanez, Megan Thee Stallion can talk about my case, so why can't I? So, as you know, the other week, or maybe a couple of weeks ago, I don't know what it feels like, you know, with COVID, the days just blurring into one. But recently, a story was leaked or a story was misinterpreted misinterpreted by large sections of the hip-hop blog space right where they basically misread the report or misread into the situation because the case filing online between megan and sally and tory lanes hadn't been updated stuff was missing so somebody came to a natural conclusion that two plus two equals ten and that somehow the case has been dropped which naturally then caused megan to go into a bit of a twitter tirade that day maybe it's because she's on a diet and she's you know feeling a little bit cranky but for some reason ill-advised of course she decided to go on social media and completely berate people for believing this fake story um rich further reiterating that she definitely thinks tori or you know without naming him reiterating that tori was the one that shot her taking aim at people that doubted her story um calling you know certain people names just a complete shit of a situation at the time, Tory kind of took it to his stride, you know, made some 
uh, not so subtle um, hints that he, you know, obviously read what she said and was aware and just kept it moving. And you thought, okay, cool. Finally, or maybe that was kind of the last straw. A lot of people was, look, we just want this thing to be over. Just reading some of the comments, people are like, you know, we're tired of this. Let's just get this story. To, let's just get this um, in the courts and let them deal with it. But now it's taking a dramatic twist because it feels like Tori is kind of fighting back against the narrative that exists out there where I think she tried to even say herself in one of the statements, Megan Thee Stallion, in the effect of like, oh, um, his team, Tori's team, keeps putting out stories and, you know, in terms of trying to discredit what she said and blah, 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 blah. So it's an entire shit of a situation, which I think in the end, no one will win. No one will come out of this smelling like roses. I think, especially when you consider that allegedly both of these people were romantically engaged in some way, shape or form along the way. And of course, you know, things end, things sometimes get a bit messy, but to, for it to get to a situation where effectively they're both trying to ruin each other's careers in in in, in their own way is really, really, uh, I will say disappointing especially when you consider at the end there is not going to be no winner no one's going to win from this both people have lost it's been a whole year maybe plus of this nonsense is it even less it might not be even a year it might be less because you know like i said covid times it all feels like a year or less than six months there's no in between but regardless i still think there's no winner in this i think both people have probably lost in terms of how they're perceived in the public in terms of the drama in terms of what's hanging over the head in terms of the resources you in order to defend themselves and just you know the lack of attention that's been placed on their music right Tory Lanez has put out two albums in this time Megan Thee Stallion put out a debut project and still no one's talking about the music everyone's talking about this case it's a complete shit show but let's read this article here from TMZ it says the following Megan Thee Stallion recently signed off about Tory Lanez allegedly shooting her and now she wants and now he wants to level the playing field and speak his mind a judge had ordered Lanez to keep his lips sealed about the gets about info he gets from the prosecutors in the case and also barred him from contacting Meg on social media but in a new court filing he has now says that's totally unfair in the docs Lane says it's unfair and Megan is able to say whatever she wants while he is basically prevented from defending himself and that I guess for me has always been the issue from minute one just from the you know because they well they I guess in a way it was made a public situation people to kind of have a, something to say about right it should have probably been dealt in the courts from minute one but regardless where we are where we are now and when I first heard the story just from my interpretation of things I never believed it I never believed Megan's side of things it just seemed a bit far-fetched that Tori would go and point blank shoot her in the feet the way that she said it happened it just didn't seem like that was accurate of what transpired did she get injured yes um, of course we saw the pictures did it maybe was it maybe a result of something being fired yes who knows i can't i'm not an expert in wounds but in terms of how she described the event it just didn't seem plausible and the thing that was always confusing to me is why just saying you didn't think what she said was accurate was a somewhat controversial take and why megan herself seemed to be so upset when people were questioning her story it just didn't make any sense because it's a story right it's an allegation we weren't there um she's obviously alleging one thing happened so you maybe file a report with the with the with the authorities you bring charges to the person who think you harmed you they investigate it and then deal with it that way but i didn't really understand why she was so insistent on making sure she corrects everybody who in her head kind of said it or reinterpreted it the wrong way it was always a really strange approach especially if you generally think that you've been harmed in a really um you know uh barbaric and crazy ways being shot in the foot right you'd want to just deal with it possibly you don't care about what these people random think on social media it just seemed a bit strange in that regard and it also seemed very odd that she seemed to be okay with just naming him in public whilst the court case is going on it just seemed a bit wild of a way to kind of go about things if ever there was a time where you had to kind of keep your counsel and make sure that the people that hurt you come to justice is this will be now right you'd, you'd want to be a little bit more careful about how you conduct your things so anyway it continues 
um there's a there's a screenshot there of her tweets that she obviously fired off when that first incorrect story was leaked and it says the following lane says he's particularly miffed about what went down last week when iranian um, reports began circulating that the charges against tory were dropped make a response to social media saying at this point i'm getting annoyed stop believing every you read on the internet imagine how i feel waking up every day seeing people lie and turn my trauma into a joke that whole time that whole team figures out ways to create doubt in my story every week and the media eats it up which I would argue isn't true. I would argue if any if there's anybody that's been consistently trying to rewrite the narrative, it's probably her team, which is understandable considering she's the one that's alleged that she got shot. So it's basically on her to keep proving that that story is accurate and reminding the nation of it, I guess. But we continue. According to Lanes, Megan falsely insinuated he and his legal team had something to do with the burgers reports therefore maligning their integrity megan also commented i can't wait until these m fucking facts come out bitch you shot me and my story not changing bitch you're going to jail now that's the bit that obviously caught everybody out it's like ish at this point it's obviously looking like you know he possibly didn't do it or the way that she remembers it it didn't happen that way so for her to continually go on about wanting to quote unquote destroy him and prove that he's the one that did it it just comes across a bit weird it just comes across a bit weird because who knows if it transpires in the court that hey she how she remembered it isn't how it actually happened and because she was you know they're both hysterical they're both maybe liquored up maybe other substances are involved there you could easily explain away and say hey from my recollection i thought this happened it didn't but then to to purposely on purpose but to quite clearly say no you're the one that did this to me you harmed me knowing full well that he's not the person that did that in an effort to ruin his career i'm not too sure how she bounces back from it if if proven her side of events didn't transpire the way it did if what she says happened then of course she's fair and free to continue squeezing everything that she can out of this story to her benefit why not it happened to you use your trauma as a way to kind of gain more success it is what it is but if it transpires that this her, how she remembers it wasn't how it actually happened what goes what happens here go from from now on how does she conduct herself in industry like how do you how do you like redeem yourself from this like what happens next do you apologize to the person that you're wrong do you apologize to the public do you just continue and act like it never happened <sighs> according to the docs lane's claims there's evidence refuting megan's side of the story including evidence of gunshot residue implicating others but because of the protection order he's not able to disclose any of that and that's a big revelation now we've been here now because i've never really heard this aspect of gunshot residue being somehow found in this case somehow gunshot residue has been found and he is basically arguing that this residue basically proves that i'm not the one that did it because you know if you've watched any decent thriller cop drama um action movie you'll know you know how usually difficult it is for the protagonist to wash away or to prevent themselves from not getting any gunshot residue on any part of their clothing and considering the early videos we saw of them during that evening that, f that fatal evening um if you remember quite clearly even from the video still that's on the screen now of megan sort of limping out of the suv they were all scantily clad none of them i don't think any of them had even a t-shirt on right the girls are in the bikinis victoria also had the shorts on so if there was gunshot residue they would be all over his body it'll be all over his hands it'll be all over his shorts whatever he's wearing it'll be on him there's no way he could have cleaned it before he got into the car before he went to the police station it just isn't gonna happen especially in la so if he does have evidence that this gunshot residue that supposedly was found on somebody else which implicates them in the issue that essentially proves that he didn't do it and what does that prove does that then prove that megan's a liar or did she misremember misremember things because if she didn't say all this stuff in the beginning it's okay you can just spin it as like yeah i was traumatized right my you know i've got no one less left in the world i just blacked out I, where i remembered what i remembered but she's she's gone on record numerous times and said no he did it 
pointed the finger and said, I know you did it. I, uh, didn't she say, well, at one point she saw him do it, even though she said she didn't see him as she was coming out of the car, right? Or something stupid like that. There was some sort of weird inconsistency of the story. Again, she could probably clear it up later, but it's not looking good, man. It really isn't. If anything, there's too much doubt in the air now at the moment for, for anyone to believe one side of the story. For sure, something happened between both of them. For sure, they got into some sort of altercation what what over we will never know because it seems like they don't want to divulge the actual truth of the issue maybe because it embarrasses them who knows but regardless i for one hope this story comes to some sort of logical conclusion very soon because i've had enough i've had enough next on the list we have this funny story courtesy of the bbc um hackney police uh attend no hacking sorry covid hackney railway arch rave attended by 300 people police came through and absolutely deaded and finished that rave in record time says the following police have issued more than fifteen thousand pounds in fines after 300 people attended an illegal rave in a railway arch um, officers raided an unlicensed music event in Nursery Road, Hackney at 1.30 a.m. on Sunday morning. Many people fled the scene while organisers padlocked the doors from the inside to stop officers getting in, police said. No arrests was reported, but 78 fines up to £200 for the breaching of lockdown were issued. A dog unit and helicopter were deployed on the scene, with police saying that they made numerous attempts to contact the organisers. Absolutely wild, isn't it? Um... Number one, peop anyone that's comfortable to receive a fine of 15,000 or 200 pounds during a pandemic when, you know, job prospects are looking really dicey, people are, you know, running out of their savings, you know, uh, universal credit doesn't go far enough. You have to be a special type of person to do that. You have to be either loaded or really dedicated to the party lifestyle. And I, I, I just don't understand it personally. I just don't get it. Um, but part of me thinks, that this is similar to like a moth being, yeah, a moth to a flame, right? You know you shouldn't. You know it's going to kill you, but you just can't help yourself. And I'm, I'm saying there must be something. I wish I could ask somebody like a Brett Weinstein or something, right? This question. I'm sure there's something uh, fundamental in our pre-existing conditions, something to do with our ancestors that drives us um, inexplicably to kind of go towards crowds and to gather around strangers in some way even when we know it's illegal like because these raves keep happening every time the fines get larger another rave get busted another rave more people more people more people and it's not only the people attending it's the organizers because the organizers usually are the ones that have to pay the most in terms of fines right because they put the party on um they kind of bear most of the burden so for you to be a promoter and risk your kind of what freedom right and miss risk your earning potential just so you can put on a rave doesn't necessarily seem worth it does it unless of course most of these people are putting on raves for like you know less than 500 pounds they own the sound system or they rent it from somebody and then you're taking cash out cash in hand at the door whatever you make extra on top goes to the kitty in terms of paying the fine in it right it, that, could, that could be a, a real option but part of me thinks these things are only fun when they're kind of genuinely illegal in a normal world where you sort of kind of go over the curfew right maybe you kind of increase the volume way above the restrictions kind of allow but in terms of a national lockdown when every single police officer is basically free and not busy and has time to attend these places and shut raves down it just feels like a complete waste of time because you'd imagine you spending most of your time on a dance floor fretting you know uh nervously looking over your shoulder hoping you don't get a tap from somebody wearing a neon jacket right that's what you're basically doing and it doesn't necessarily in my opinion equate for a good time out i would think so i don't know maybe it's just me um it continues here it says um Con is it constable constable ch superintendent roy smith said there was a serious and blatant breach of the public health regulation and law <clears throat> officers were forced yet again to put their own health at risk to deal with a large group of incredibly selfish people who really who were tightly packed together in a confined space providing an ideal opportunity for the steady virus to spread not just organizers but all the present as such legal parties can expect to be issued a fine and i guess they hold them all out into this weird uh place in the, in between I guess where the 
actual arches were um sort of like a cul-de-sac and then they basically issued them all with fines i think you can see a couple of the people here actually in, inside the actual circle so it's a clever way they kind of herded them all like basically cattle in it it continues here oh, we know we say that there is a national lockdown but yeah i don't know man there is something about this that there is a that is probably part of us that we just can't let go even during this crazy time we just want to be around some strangers and i guess the sooner the world opens the better for all of us ba, 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 ba. what else we have here oh so talking about festivals and partying this is courtesy of Mixmag. It says the following. Glastonbury founder Michael Evas uh, wants to do a smaller version of the festival in September. And imagine, I, I, remember, I think I said this in my previous podcast about it. I mentioned because obviously you're more than aware that Glastonbury had, has now postponed their festival until next year because obviously they couldn't um, guarantee that they could run a smooth event this year due to the coronavirus and not being able to possibly get some protection from insurance in terms of making sure it goes on, blah -de blah 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 but I did argue in my other episode that I think most likely if the festival wasn't as large as it was, you know, sorry, Glastonbury being one of our bigger festivals here in the UK, taking up an entire village, they will probably be able to do it sometime later in the year from like August onwards. So this makes complete sense. If they're able to do like a smaller scale version of Glastonbury, they could definitely, yeah, I could definitely envisage them doing it sometime in September, especially with the vaccine, especially with things opening up, rapid testing. There's definitely a option or an avenue for that to happen going forward. And again, I think it's some good news for us um, nightlife aficionados and you know dance music scene fans and club fans it is some light in the tunnel because what this means is that most places for the most especially if they've got the capacity and they can put some things safeguards in place you would assume there is a possibility that you'll be able to dance on a dance floor again before the end of the year You'd be able to be in the nightclub with flipping smoke and lasers shining in your ears and your pupils will dilate it by the end of the year at the earliest, which is great because obviously my original prediction was that raving, raving will only return next year. But if, if Glastonbury founders think they have an opportunity to do a smaller festival in September, that's a good option. If they want, if they're really, you know, if the UK government are really hell bent on making sure they hold the G7 summit in person in Cornwall, in Cornwall, yeah, I think in June or July, then that's a good sign. There are little things that are happening outside of your maybe purview that are definitely going to add or definitely give credence to this idea that, okay, cool, maybe from you say may onwards life will get back to some sort of normality in the uk and you can get back to your living everyday life which is great to see but let's read the article here it says uh gaston founder michael evis has said that he wants to do a smaller version of the festival in september um evis was speaking after it was announced gaston 2021 was cancelled for the second year in a road due to coronavirus trying to radio station lbc uh, about the potential plans the 85 year old said the following I would like to do something September I would like to do something smaller somewhere around the anniversary date when we first started which was the 18th of September 1970 and I would like to consider possibly doing something around that time perfect and perfect perfect idea if a small iteration of the iconic event were to happen he also suggested that artists of the caliber who play the real thing could be booked the likes of Kendrick Lamar and Pesha Boys are booked to 2020 uh, replying to radio host um, Tom Swarbick question ever said yeah but I do need to get real assurances from the FX people and everything the 2020 council came after Michael said back in August last year that the Worthy Farm event might not roll until 2022. In June, he revealed a fear of going bankrupt. The festival couldn't take place. At the end of the year, UK MPs warned that Glasgow and other festivals may not be able to go ahead in 2021 if the insurance wasn't underwritten due to COVID laws pandemic. So again, some light in the tunnel. Um, hold on if you're like myself and you're just you know i'm missing the dance floor more than anything to be honest i'm missing being around strangers and you know pumping my fists in the air running around like an absolute lunatic queuing up for toilets like that is part of my you know regular <laughs> that that is part of my identity i've now come to understand and if anything maybe the benefit of this time spent away from the dance floor is maybe giving you an appreciation of that culture that you miss right something you maybe took for granted i know i did even though i, I live in london and the epicenter of you know 
uh, clubs and musical scenes and stuff, right? I'm just spoiled, inundated with places to go to. And even I feel like I didn't really take that much advantage of where I live. And now, you know, given this second opportunity to do the stuff that I love again, I'm not going to take it for granted for sure. And I'm sure most of you are feeling the same. So hang on, hold on. You'll be able to dance again very, very soon. What else do we have here? Oh, we have an interesting interview here, courtesy of The Independent with, with the one and only Bicep, who I guess are putting out a new album, EP or something along those lines, right? It must be. That's why they're talking to the press. It has to be that. There's no other reason why they'll be talking to The Independent, I would imagine. <laughs> but this is the this is the article. It says, Bicep, seeing Rich Leaders playing big raves during the pandemic is absolutely disgusting. Belfast-born London-based electronic Bicep duo are about to release a most paid album of 2021. But they told Sean Griffiths that they had no patience for people playing shows or the UK government. So, number one, I'm surprised an act like Bicep are putting out an album now without being able to tour um i think we're already seeing people like drake you know postponing their album and there is a rumor out there that the reason why he did that is because he was given some sort of heads up from who knows who people some some higher up elites or the illuminati gave him a heads up and let him know that hey um the world's going to reopen very soon don't release your album too early give yourself the opportunity to tour and make the most of it so you'd imagine an act like bicep you know they are a high production level performance dj duo right they don't do half measures they don't just turn up and play in front of a black screen at a club they put together an absolute performance you see what they did at print works right that show from what i saw from youtube looked amazing they really went out of their way to make that a real once in a lifetime opportunity and i'm sure those people that went to that event are chuffed that they went before the lockdown so it was surprising to see them even put out this album considering what's going on but I guess, you know, they, they went to feed their fans, their prolific producers. Um, I definitely feel them out of regard. But it's interesting to see their opinion when it comes to this playgrave pandemic that's happening at the moment, right? Um, what do I think? I think before you read the article, I think generally my thoughts have kind of wavered, I guess, like most people during the lockdown. I think most of my frustration and most people's frustration with it generally comes because you and i can't go anywhere right it's definitely something that's been reserved for the privileged few it's definitely something that's exasperated or maybe highlighted and reminded us of the inequalities and um the disparity in treatment and accessibility and just the downright unfairness of the dance music industry especially once you cut going higher and higher up the tiers and band of acts and where they go and play and it's just grossly unfair in it right that you are having to stay indoors sacrifice all your leisurely and cultural delights and things that you love to get up to with your friends but these people um are deeming themselves to be essential flying to d legitimately developing and third world countries uh uh taking advantage of a lax government who are not really looking after their population and citizenship as they should and going there and collecting the coins and playing in front of what looks like a whole community of expats who are themselves privileged and probably part of the one percent in that country that they're living in so it's, it's it kind of comes a bit yicky but now as time has gone by i've come to the realization or i've come to just accept that it made mainly is the responsibility of the government to have restrictions in place that prevent international DJs from flying hundreds of thousands of miles um, to come and play in a villa somewhere in a mountain, right? They should have things in place that prevent that. The moment that they leave those opportunities open in order for them to line their back pockets, however crap they may be, or to allow it to pay for a road, you know, uh, reconstruction of a road, whatever it may be, they're going to have to accept, unfortunately, the harsh consequences of it, which is, you know, a spike in cases, a spike in deaths, and all this other nonsense that comes with with booking a DJ to go play and after I was set somewhere during the global pandemic. So for the most part, I could care less. I think we have our own issues to worry about here on our shores. And again, I think as a global dance community, it's disappointing to see some of your more bigger acts who are, you would say, 
affluent and maybe well off who can afford to miss out on the odd rave in the middle of Tulum right because that's the thing that's weird also it's I think apart from that rave in Ukraine where Sally C and Freddie K and a few other people played from Berlin right there hasn't really been any other high prof not high prof there hasn't been anything else of that scale that I've seen maybe I've missed some things but I haven't really seen it and again I think if you split up DJs in tiers you'd say there's three tiers right low middle and high and in each tier there's two it's split in two again so there's low low high low blah blah blah. so if that's the case we've seen a lot of DJs who occupy the tier two and three or one and two what the the, the, the top two tiers playing in these play grades but we haven't really seen a lot of the bottom tier DJs playing these places who probably you would imagine need those gigs more so than the ones playing in the top two tiers because for the most part if you believe what you read on the internet those guys in the top two tiers earn anywhere between 5,000 euros to 10,000 to 30,000 during you know normal times I guess now maybe they've taken some sort of uh, hit on their salaries and their fees that they get paid because the places that they're playing at can't you know operate at full capacity so they can't give an opportunity to make their money back as a promoter bloody blah 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 but still there's less tier one entry level DJs playing play graves than there are actual top top line mix mag DJ mag resident advisor headlining people playing which is this that's the bizarre thing that seems about it um so let's continue with the article and see what Bice had to say about the issue and I'll continue on um I think it's somewhere here the, 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 uh, okay cool so the whole paragraph says they settled down to make aisles in 2019 taking most of the year off touring to concentrate on writing they didn't expect to have them make the most of 2020 off too when the pandemic struck in the pair were mixing and mastering the album and looking forward to two sold out nights in Brixton Academy their plans were scuppered but the duo seemed sanguine about the card fate has dealt them he, they said we came to terms with everything being out of control last year uh we're keen to do live shows but it happens when it happens they're less laid back about djs who continue to play gigs during the summer of 2020 several high profile djs including nina kravis dax j played across europe they were legal but arguably ill-advised definitely not socially distanced seeing these established djs who have money playing big raves during the pandemic is absolutely disgusting says mcbriar um it's drawn a line between the artists who think like businessmen and strategize on how to exact as much money as possible from everything and the people who are driven by creativity um they don't need to do this chips in ferguson take a year off write an album so many people lower down the dance music are struggling and this paints the whole industry in a bad light it's just that their egos need a constant massaging now i think i've come to the realization i'm kind of cool with it and I've just moved on and i've stopped being outraged by seeing people playing play graves because i've come to the conclusion and realization because we we'll speak about next year uh next but a lot of these djs aren't really djs they're mostly influencers who have found a way to influence without standing around wearing loud clothes and doing those stupid poses on the gram right they found a way to do it and the way they do it is playing records so if that's the case and if influencers first dj seconds we shouldn't be judging them the same way we would judge an actual dj right because an actual dj wouldn't want to be seen at a play grave so they'd maybe not promote it they wouldn't take any pictures they'd want to do it if it would have to be like a corporate event done behind closed doors but they wouldn't want to you know put up a post saying oh it's the first time i'm being on a flight i can't wait to go here it's amazing during a global pandemic they just wouldn't want to do it but i think these people are so i would say not say demented but they're so they're so addicted to the dopamine hits of the likes and stuff that they have no other way to get that apart from going and playing somewhere and having their hands in the air like in, in dj pose so they would have to go and play these play graves so it's kind of something that they just can't avoid taking up and of course maybe the money's good of course the access just the boredom of staying at home and not being able to play week in week out if you're a dj that doesn't spend that much time at home you know you only have to read a couple of interviews with resident advisors to see the amount of djs that brag about 
about the amount of time they don't spend at home and not with their family and they're always on the road I haven't unwrapped my furniture in my house all this sort of nonsense it's no surprise that those very same people are addicted and just can't let go of um, or put a pause on their career during a global pandemic which is insane to think of right I, I, I think no one else in music so far has been able to perform to a level that they have been in the past right I'm sure the Arctic Monkeys would like to play a gig sometime soon but you don't see them playing plague events do you know what I mean so that's the interesting side of it so again as weird as it may be at the moment um I do think a lot of it has to obviously is has to come from we are unable to do it ourselves where you know it's not allowed the venues that we want to go to are all closed some of them will want to be opened once the, re, the economy reopens anyway so we're going to lose a lot of great places and then we're seeing these people on our gram flying from you know from place to place playing in all these different exotic locations during the pandemic and effectively taking advantage of governments who are probably looking after the population as they should um and then doing it obviously to earn a quick buck it should it should it should bother you it should upset you but there's nothing more there's not much you can do from wherever you sit it, again there's a responsibility of the government to put in to put restrictions in place that prevent people from traveling hundreds of miles to go and play at a beach somewhere if that doesn't happen then we can only concentrate on what we can concentrate on our own shores but again like i said it's a good thing because what it does do is it does open your eyes and tell you um the kind of people that you're supporting and it should kind of remind it should kind of provide you the opportunity to recalibrate who you support and who you back now not for the good or for the bad I'm not telling you who should support who you should not support but it should be a constant reminder of like okay cool there are some people who are in this for the music they're in this for the for the vibes they're in this for the culture whatever it may be right and there's some people who are clearly just in it for the self-branding the marketing purposes the likes on social media which is never a good or a bad thing it just is what it is and if that's the case choose your heroes wisely choose your dj heroes wisely next on the list talking about choosing your dj heroes wisely is nastia the most brain dead uh unaware dj that ever existed in the entire world i think so i think she might be the most she must be she must be up there um so I've covered it before that she was going to she was going on tour somewhere in Colombia, right? And maybe some other neighboring South American countries or Central American countries, not too sure. But regardless, Nastya decided to leave her home of Kiev, I think Ukraine, she's from somewhere there or maybe Russia, and travel all the way to Central and South America to play a couple of gigs during a growing pandemic. And of course, her reasoning behind it and rationale was that, oh, they obviously booked me. It's quote unquote safe to go. If it wasn't, then I would be able to go and play these events. And I don't know, it's just an interesting and eye-opening um, situation because why this makes it more interesting is obviously i said prayer prior i think this is a good reminder another it should be another indication as to the separation between djs and influencers and i think people like nasty and a few others are mostly influencers who happen to dj as opposed to djs who have influence that's what i think right and if that's the case it should explain why they are so happy and gleeful to share that they're playing in these places in the first place during the pandemic which is a, a super no-no if i was going to advise somebody and you actually went to go play and i was going to advise you i'd say hey just don't post the thing that you're going to go do especially not on your own account it just makes you look um it just makes you look completely insane but you do it anyway because you need a dopamine heat because why you are an influencer first so this is an example this is courtesy of her instagram page and i guess it's after the actual event took off and she writes the most tone deaf statement a caption you ever see i'm sure we will come back to the times when djing will not be a reason for judgment soon so she's using it as a moment to kind of play victim. Somehow she's the victim in this. Thank you, Colombia. It was my best visit so far. Hello, Ecuador. It's been seven years. We haven't seen each other. I'll meet you at the Los Beach Club tonight. Pictures by whoever that is. So she's boasting about playing in Colombia and looking forward about playing another gig in Ecuador. Pretty, uh, pretty brazen and just an interesting, again, approach. Like you would imagine somebody, this is another example of the, of the, bicep thing right somebody of her level who plays of the frequency that she plays especially during a lockdown you'd imagine that you know 
you probably don't need to play this gig. Is this really going to move the needle for your career during a global pandemic? Is anyone of note going to remember the set that you played in a random location somewhere in Colombia that really set the roof on fire and took you to the next level? Is this where you the culture moves, really? I don't know. Probably not. Is it like a secondary third market that's only being able to book you because you don't have anywhere else to play? probably yes um but again the tone deaf responses don't stop from there we've got this other guy too called a waff um it's pretty easy to spot who the dj is from this picture right probably not they both look like absolute bellends but regardless and you i bet you're wondering what kind of music they play agostino you know what music they play you know what music they play and i can tell you it's not techno yeah it starts with a t but it definitely <laughs> isn't just techno so um he posted a picture and i think somebody a lot of people had some pretty choice words to say about his decision to uh, lay up somewhere in Tulum. I think if I can find it, let me see if I can find this on here. Somebody wrote some, maybe it got deleted. Someone wrote a comment here about his decision to go and he went back and forth and essentially said things that you would imagine. There we go, I liked it. So the following uh, Care for the Planet, Ricky Healer, uh, Care for All the Walks of Life. Then the wanker goes and travels to a country whose capital hospitals are currently facing severe capacity issues due to COVID and would probably justify it by saying, I, but it's Tulum, ain't much COVID here. But realizing after all the plastic surgery um, ladies and overprivileged hombres at the party go home, they're likely to have to spread the spread it to the resort staff airport airline staff and any other member of people they come into contact with the fucking level of ignorance and privilege is unreal holy shit uh pura vida though right pura vida right so obviously all directed to that wife guy and you'd imagine a pretty stern and direct criticism especially one that's been liked 11 times and you know it just generally speaks to the uh to the lack of perspective and overall morals and ethics that go on with all this sort of imagine you'd imagine the response would be like yeah you're right lad or just ignoring it but look at the reply the reply is very illuminating because it shows you just how odd these people are and i say these people because they're not really your typical dj they're a bit odd in that respect of how they kind of could navigate in life so this is the following um this is from him right um where is it uh, so true he said yeah why would i not come to a beautiful place where it's fine why did i like that i shouldn't like that take off why would i not come to a beautiful place where it's fine to do so he says right why 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 what do you want um that i just sit inside my house and be scared like you are so again so it's interesting that most of these people who are playing are probably in the camp of or definitely as you've seen here they're in the camp of it's not that big of a deal right it's a it's just at the common cold um that i just sit inside my house and be scared like you are i would be happy for you to come here and have uh show you some time away and guess what you can do it it's fine to do so there are so many families all the people and everyone here just living their lives in a restaurant and bars what is it you're so angry with what do you what do why do you just want people to just stay inside and be scared i wish you all the best and i hope you can find the time to get yourself away from everything and enjoy your life so there's this idea that somehow this is enjoying your life right taking the virus from your home country to another developing country so you can play your shitty brand of tech house surrounded by your you know not so delightable <laughs> delightful friends in an effort to what move the culture forward it's just a funny 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 set of people really um is there any images of him playing his shitty music nope but he continues but then the one that's really funny is this young lady blondish right she was on the beach is it here on the beach collecting plastic and doing what this not what there's a real weird correlation with these djs who go out and supposedly clean the beach but then they're happy to go to the country and go and play <laughs> the play grave it's just fucking fantastic i absolutely love it the hypocrisy is just really cool i'm not gonna lie i love a good bit of hypocrisy because why not it keeps the body warm and it helps you move on and of course here business text you know, put together a little collage of people playing play graves all over spain i think in barcelona covid cases in spain are up and going where they should be going spain is facing record numbers of cases a video here of a behind the scenes party happening in madrid 
with a sign not allowing phones on the inside and that's the thing the irony of this right obviously the music is flipping terrible but there's a sticker outside the door that says no phones right don't use your phone keep this secret but because they're surrounded by absolute spanners who are only in this for the likes and the retweets why else would they be there if they can't use their phones they wouldn't attend they want everyone to see their outfit they want people to they want everyone on their timeline to see them having fun to see them sipping on champagne twirling their hands in the air doing that white girl spinning dance thing they do doing that tech house bro thing where you flick your wrist if they, if they can't do that on the ground why will they go why would they go so the irony is even though you're trying to keep it secret so you don't get any backlash on social media the very people that come there are only coming there so they can post those clips on social media to like you know uh from their noses at people who aren't there and also to kind of ensure that they get their engagement up it's pretty pretty <laughs> Fair enough, it's, you know, it's Spain, so the music is a bit different, but still, imagine leaving your home to go and listen to something like this. Can't you just play this via your Spotify? Do you really need to go to a rave to hear this shit? Especially this sort of rave. But as well, what is it? I've, I, I, this is maybe something I need to find out there must be something about tech house that makes people because at the beginning of the lockdown don't get me wrong there were a few naughty people in, in france in paris especially look at those possession techno people i'm sure they have to realize that they have some blood on their hands right those warehouse raves that they were putting on i'm sure didn't didn't help to quell the numbers of covid cases uh, if you look at the stuff that's happening in berlin in bunkers and all these sort of places people were getting up to some nonsense right but when it got cranked up and you were told to kind of like you couldn't do any large-scale raves anymore they kind of died down and for the most part people are just really getting themselves to house raves but what is it about tech house that makes people that is just drives people to put the events on and makes them want to attend at all cost there's something about tech house raves that just you know they're just people just can't say no they just want to go to them at all costs they want to fly like i said halfway around the world to go play them the ravers want to go and you know potentially have you know randoms on social media sending them death threats like there's something about tech house that is so appealing to a certain group of people that they simply must do it at all times it must be a thing they just can't go a year a month a week a day by without having the ability to listen to some sort of generic tech house tune that you can't tell apart from the other 75 million tech house tunes you've heard what is it about it let me know what is it <laughs> and no one's ever dancing there's no one dancing at the rave it's all kind of dead right everyone's just looking at each other nodding there's nothing there's no vibe it doesn't even look like a fun party it just looks like people i don't know standing around <laughs> listen to that shit but hey here we are i wonder what's going on there who knows who knows who knows uh what else do we have here mm. yeah i think that's it i think that's it you know we're already an hour in don't waste too much more of your time hey you know what i saw what i see i saw this talking about raves I saw this GmbH this is like typical and for me perfect Berkheim club wear right or just some sort of techno establishment club wear that's probably one of my resolutions as well going forward for this year visit at least two new um you know nightclub venues around Europe just go somewhere and just check them out just to be just to be seen and be just to be seen and be seen just to see and be seen see and be seen yeah that's the thing for sure these outfits will go off into bliss here. You know? Imagine me rocking something like this in fucking Georgia. What's my favorite outfit? The white shirt, and this is the one. God damn, that looks fire. 
and in case you're wondering if you're listening via the audio it's the gmbh 421 menswear show look number eight i'd wear the hell out of that outfit i'd wear the hell out of the outfit anyway like i said this is the excellent zinga show episode number 426 i'm gonna say it's not five maybe 426 thanks so much for tuning in it's been a pleasure to have your company if it's your first time check out the show via youtube make sure you smash that like button hit subscribe leave me a comment down below and if you're listening via the podcast that please leave me a five star review and share with your friends until next time i'll see you guys again very very soon take care be safe peace